Hi, welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Carr and I'm coordinator for the Coastal Marine Ecosystem Based Management Tools Network coordinated by NatureServe. And I'd like to uh, welcome our other co-organizer here today, Nick Weiner from Open Channels. Um, um, we're very pleased to have uh, Diogo Verissimo here with us today. He's going to speak on, uh, well, to target everyone is to target no one, uh, a quote he had in a recent article that appeared in the Marine Ecosystems and Management Newsletter. And he's going to speaking, be speaking about what social marketing can offer conservation and management. Uh, Diogo is with RARE, Georgia State University, and he's a Smith Fellow, uh, which is a program run by the Society for Conservation Biology. Um, before we get started, I wanted to let everyone know how to ask questions. We have dedicated time for question and answer at the end of the presentation, but um, if you want to send in questions during the presentation, you can type them in to the question panel of the user interface, um, and then substantive questions will hold to the question and answer period. Um, right, but if you have any quick clarifying questions, um, you could send those to, and I might uh, be able to stop Diogo and ask those questions, depending on what they are. Mm -hmm. Um, but we encourage you to send in questions throughout the presentation. Um, there's also the option during the question and answer period uh, to ask your question directly to Diogo. With it. Um, and you do that by raising your virtual hand. There's a little hand icon in your user interface. If you raise that, then I can unmute you and you can ask the question directly to Diogo. Um, this option only works if you have a working microphone or if you've called in on the phone if you've entered your PIN number. So anyway, uh, welcome Diogo. We're so glad you could be here today. I'll turn it over to you now. Sure. Thank you very much for, for the invitation. It's, uh, it's really great to see um, a webinar on, on, this, on this sort of interface between conservation and marketing uh, really have um, that much, uh, get that much traction and get that much interest. Certainly that's, that would not have been the case uh, even four or five years ago. So it's, it's really great um, yeah, to have this opportunity to talk to you all. Um, so I'll, I'll start with uh, two very quick minutes about myself. Um, so my name is Diogo Verissimo. I was born in Portugal, in Lisbon. I live in Washington, D.C. currently, and my first job in conservation was as an educator at the Lisbon Zoo, also in Portugal. So today, I'm, I'm hoping to talk a little bit about what marketing is. I'm hoping to do a little bit of marketing for social marketing. And I'm hoping to then get a little bit more practical and talk about, about how, how, how do these, these principles apply in more practical situations when you actually want to use them? How can they actually improve um, the way we message and the way we sort of communicate with our, um, with our target audiences? And then at the very end, give you a couple of examples of um, some of these things that are already happening at the interface between particularly marine conservation and uh, and marketing that um, can be interesting examples or resources um, for you to use and uh, and look up uh, after the webinar. So okay, so what is marketing in the end? Um, so one of the interesting things about marketing is that, um, and one of the things that really got me interested as uh, as I was sort of looking more into conservation was that marketing really doesn't sit uh, as a traditional academic discipline. It's more of a professional, sort of more of a, a, a practitioner's a field. So it, if you go to university, for example, it sits in the business school a little bit uh, oddly, sort of in, in between a lot of different, other, a lot of other things. Um, and that's good. Um, and that's interesting that it's difficult to sort of box marketing so, you know, create defined boundaries around it because really, when you think about um, marketing in a traditional sense and consumer behavior, there's really a lot of different fields that we could draw on and learn from um, and, and use tools from um, to, to, to be able to be more, more effective. So, you know, psychology, sociology, anthropology, even, even fields outside the social sciences, like neurobiology, for example, are very relevant to the types of uh, questions and challenges that uh, marketeers face. So, if you want to break it down to the most sort of basic, simple element, it can be broken down into this sort of uh, scheme. We have a, you know, sellers and buyers, you have an exchange, products and services go one way, money goes the other way, and you have some sort of communication loop where the sellers communicate to the buyers and sort of talk to them about how great their offer is, and at the same time, the buyers sort of have this feedback loop, they close the feedback loop by actually choosing, by exerting, you know, they have their um, the choices and by making those choices and revealing their preferences, they actually tell the sellers what works for them and what doesn't. 
So obviously, this is a pretty simplified, you know, two boxes, four arrows um, sort of scheme. And once you sort of break down that one arrow that says marketing, um, you start seeing there's actually quite a lot under the hood. So traditionally, and um, for those of you who might have uh, had a little bit of contact with uh, some of marketing theory, for example, you know that um, there's a, these, 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 these sort of institution of marketing called the four P's of marketing. So you have, you have them, the product price, the place, and the promotion. So these four things are, are really, really sort of summarize a lot of what marketeers do. And they have a lot under, under, under in each of these headings. So, you know, you think about your product in the traditional sense will be what you're offering. So in terms of the, the features and the brand name, all of that, the place is more about the channels, how you communicate. Promotion is what's more visible usually, things like advertising. And then price, which could be financial if you're talking about uh, or, or a, a monetary cost if you're talking about actual business transaction in the very traditional sense of marketing. But it could also be a different thing. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a little, a little something about that now. So a lot of these concepts don't necessarily apply uh, or seem pretty distant uh, to the reality of what conservation sort of practitioners um, face and, and the conservation problems that we try to solve. Um, however, this sort of scheme that uh, we just we just talked about can actually be translated into something that becomes, I think, a lot more relevant very quickly. Um, so if you're in a position where you're hoping to drive a particular, the adoption of a particular behavior or a particular change in a behavioral pattern, in essence what you're doing is you have usually some sort of value uh, proposition that you want to make to your to a group of people and, and ask them to change behavior in exchange for that. That's usually the, that, that would be a, a more sort of social marketing -y way of looking at it. And obviously, you know, the way you do that, the way you uh, talk and communicate and message that target audience group is your social marketing effort. And then at the end, you have that feedback loop that closes and you, know, you see if people are on board with your message, if they agree with you, if they, um, if they are, um, if they're sort of in sync with what you're uh, communicating to them or not really. So that's where the loop closes. Um, there's actually another challenge uh, when talking about what is what is marketing, what is social marketing, um, and that is that there are a lot of other terms out there that are somewhat similar, that have some um, relationship with marketing, uh, and that are used very often interchangeably, as if they all mean sort of the same thing, but they don't, and so that it's sometimes creates difficulties in communicating and, and really understanding what it, what is it we're talking about when we're talking about something like social marketing, for example. So in this case, for example, I won't go through all of them just in the interest of time, but I'll go through a few that um, have a tendency to crop up quite a lot. So one of them is social media, this, this distinction between what is social media, what is social marketing, um, and is also, <laughs> to make it even more uh, uh, complicated is even a social media marketing um, but anyway I'll stick to these two for now and so in essence so social marketing is in essence using uh, marketing techniques and concepts to improve uh, or, or to to drive a, a change in behavior uh, that will benefit the person who changes the behavior and society at large so that's a very sort of high-level definition of what social marketing is but social media is just a channel. In this case, it could be you know it could be Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram. The things the most the more sort of widely used um, sort of channels. But social media is just about a channel, a, a channel you can use to get a particular message to your target audience. Uh, and so, those are actually quite two different things. If you think about uh, you know just a, a minute ago when we were talking about the four P's of marketing. So this this social media is one part of the place of the four P's. So it's something quite quite specific and quite uh, small when compared to you know, marketing as a whole. Um, the other one that comes up very often is advertising. And very often it's used interchangeably because um, it is very often what's more visible. Once you go through a marketing effort, advertising really is what very often what's more, uh, what stands out and what you'll get uh, your contact with. And so, but again, you know, coming back, really advertising is about sort of framing your message uh, in a way and, and, and sort of expressing the
the concepts you want to get across in a way that's meaningful to the target audience. And so it really focuses on the, again, looking back at the, the four Ps that we looked at just a minute ago in the promotion sort of side of things. So again, it's just one part of one, one small part of what a marketing effort uh, entails. So having sort of talked a little bit about what, what, mar what social marketing marketing is and what is not, uh, I also wanted to um, uh, do a little bit of marketing for social marketing and sort of um, get a bit of the, uh, get, get, give you a bit of sense of why I think the use of these uh, of marketing principles and concepts is really important and can really give a, a, advance our ability to uh, have a, a so impact in terms of environmental sustainability, in terms of the way that people relate to the environment. And so some of these things um, that you'll see that I'll talk about are things that you can find in other fields, some of them not so much, but I think I really want to highlight is sort of what they mean when they come all together. And so one, one sort of key uh, element that I think is really important when we're talking about using the use of, of marketing tools, or social marketing tools, is really this focus on behavior change. And so, but, and what I mean by that is that it's not so, we're not focusing on change, changes in knowledge, changes in attitudes, um, changes in behavioral intentions. We're really focusing on behavior change or, be, or the adoption of a behavior. So it's a behavior focus. Um, and the reason I sort of emphasize this is that obviously, you know, knowledge and attitudes uh, they might have a role to play. Um, research shows that the actual link between changes in knowledge and changes in attitudes, it's often very weak when it comes to actual behavior change. And so marketing, marketing uh, might, have, um, they might, might have some interest in understanding and, and it very often has in, you know, a lot of strategic understanding of attitudes and knowledge and what the gaps are, but the success of an initiative boils down to behavior. And I think that's really important that we focus on the things that really have uh, some actual real-world impact. Sort of another, uh, in, another sort of side of marketing that I think is, is very important is this focus on evaluation, on learning what works and what doesn't, which is, I would argue, as important, if not more important, than what, learning what works. Um, and this is because very often we all realize that marketing or... or, or uh, not marketing conservation is uh, a sort of medium long term effort and it's not something we can solve very quickly but at the same time we can only really think about long term efforts if we have that learning from uh, the the different efforts that we put on the ground that we that we make and really understanding oh what well, this works this doesn't and through time make uh, our our work more effective and more efficient and so that sort of feeds into this idea of sustainability and how do we sustain these efforts for behavior change for example through uh, longer periods of time and it's only really with this uh, knowledge of how we're doing what what is it that we do that works and what doesn't that um, that we can uh, really move forward. Sort of the other aspect I've sort of alluded to a little bit, and this is this, this idea of a value exchange, this idea that um, when you're asking for um, a, you know, a particular audience to adopt a behavior or to change their behavior, um, you really should be thinking about what is it that you're offering them? What is, the, what is the value that you're offering them in exchange for that changing behavior. So it's not so much this, you know, uh, it's just assuming that it's the right thing to do and they, you know, people should preserve the panda or it is because it's uh, our, you know, her heritage. It's it's more thinking about, right, you know, this is, this is what I'm asking from my target audience. What am I offering my target audience? And having this very clear sort of understanding that we are talking about an exchange when we're talking about a behavior change campaign. We are talking about uh, an exchange. And so what is it, what is the value that we're creating for our target audience that allows them then to then uh, reciprocate and give us this adoption of behavior, change in behavior. Um, at the same time, it's also this idea that we don't live in sort of a vacuum. So when we, when we think about our target audiences, um, that there's surely going to be a lot of competition for their time, for their attention, just general mind space. And so if we want to get our message to them, we're going to have to be pretty aware of what other competing messages there might be, uh, in, not even also in terms of our target audience, but also in terms of the type of 
concept and messaging that we're trying to get across. Um, so it's pretty important to have this recognition that um, yes, there are other things that are out there we're going to compete with our uh, our initiative and how do we not only compare to them but how do we fit into that landscape that's already existing of information. Um, lastly, um, the thing I am sort of focused a little bit, uh, and I think you can might get that from the title of the of the presentation, is this idea of really focusing on on your on your on your audience, really focusing understanding things through their value system and through their eyes, and really understanding how they perceive the issue and what they perceive to be the advantages and disadvantages. At the same time, also having this the sense that you'll you'll never be able to work with everyone everywhere. And so you have to be more strategic when it comes to what are the groups that are more relevant, more important for um, for the particular challenge that you're that you're facing. And this is something that I'm going to focus on a little bit more um, just after, um, just in the, in the following uh, slides. At the same time, and you know, what we do have this effort on segmentation, thinking about which are the prior priority groups, who are the groups we should be working the most with. Um, but at the same time, having this understanding that even if there is uh, one priority group, very often or in, in some situations, these groups, there are other groups who are important to influence the behavior of uh, the group of people that we, uh, we hope to, to target. And these might be peers, they might be um, you know, elders in, in some cultures, they might be um, companies, corporations, they might be um, sort of um, political structures and who might be also pretty important in influencing the behavior of, of of that one target group that we are concerned about. And so also having keeping that in mind and uh, sort of having this deep realization that um, that these whatever groups that we prioritize, they don't uh, exist in a vacuum. So focusing on exactly exactly what I, I've been talking about, this idea that you can't work with everyone everywhere, um, that this is need for prioritization. Um, I want to sort of talk a little bit about um, about this idea of um, of the of a target audience, I guess. So you know, in this slide, I'll I'll, I'll I represented a lot a few mythical creatures, um, but only one of them really has featured heavily in. The scientific literature and the peer-reviewed literature, and that's the the general public. So this idea that um, there's this homogenous group of people out there that sort of encompasses everywhere and every everything and everyone um, that um, that you have you have to work with in in some way that you it, it's somehow somehow the the your, your target audience. Um, but actually, I mean, once you get down to an actual conservation issue, um, you it, it's it's that's never the case. It's never you never rarely find or uh, an homogeneous group of people. People are pretty. All groups have a lot of diversity within them, and uh, even within uh, group people with similar uh, traits, you might have or very often find that they didn't perceive the same the same thing, the same message, for example, in very very different ways. And so there is that diversity that we must be pretty aware of and, and, and consider uh, when we're thinking about who, 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 who matters, who are the people, that, who are the groups that are relevant um, to the effort that, that we're making. So yeah, so once, once we have this, this, uh, this sort of notion, really there are two processes that are, that are important. And of course here, I mean, we're not talking about customers, I took this from a a commercial marketing book, we're talking really about target audiences. And this is really two steps really. One is the understanding that there are several groups in the population that we're working with. Um, and then the thinking, oh well, within these groups, which ones are the most important? Uh, and which one, which are the ones that are most relevant uh, for us to work with uh, in the context of whichever conservation challenge uh, you're, you're dealing with. So obviously one way, there's many, many ways of doing this, but one way I'd, I always like to s start is by thinking about ex you know, very, being very exact and concrete about what is the threat, the conservation issue that you're dealing with. So there's many ways of, of scoring and uh, rating threats. This is just one uh, where you look at scope, severity, and irre irreversibility. 
uh, and then have some sort of uh, way of coming up with a total ranking. And this is just so that there's complete clarity on what is the issue you're working on. And so very often it's, I find that um, it is for, for, for those, those of us who have a, a very, um, a lot of detailed knowledge on a particular issue, it might be very clear, but it's not also, it, it's not often, it's often the case that it's not clear for everyone the same way. And so it's really important to have this very strong sense of what is the exact problem that is being tackled? What is the, the conservation issue that we want to deal with? And only then start thinking about, okay, well, who are the groups that might be relevant? Who are the groups that might be relevant to the particular issue that we're dealing with? And, you know, again, you'll surely find there are multiple groups who are, are important, but not all will be important in the same way. And so start thinking about, okay, well, how do we set priorities? What are the most important uh, groups and why? Um, from then on, uh, at the same time, and, and, and a little bit sort of uh, uh, as I was as I was mentioning, I think before, um, you will still find even if you're working with, uh, say, the fishermen of a, a particular county or a particular province or a partic even a particular community, if even if it's a small scale, you'll still find there's a lot of heterogeneity. And so sometimes there's um, the temptation to sort of ignore that that variation, that differences, um, and sort of have some a campaign designed for the average fisherman or the average, um, you know, member of your target audience when sort of uh, uh, smoothing out all those uh, those differences. And I think that could really be problematic. Uh, and in one way, and this is one of the roles that research really plays in, in marketing, is really to get a little bit of a, of a grip on what are the important differences and what are the the key groups, in what ways do the members of Italian audience differ from each other? And so this is uh, obviously a, a, a thing that requires a little bit of a little bit of investment in research. And this is really, um, I think, one of the ways where you can see it, it's easiest to see that um, um, that qualitative and quantitative methods have both a really big part to play in uh, in in marketing and really. In, in this initial process of getting to understand um, getting to understand our target audience so beyond this process of um, understanding who who it is we're talking to and how how do these these the different members of that group differ from each other and what are they, the, the key characteristics we need to be aware of, then there's this idea that when we communicate with that group of people, we need to have a message and uh, the content and the concepts we're communicating need to resonate with them. And so this is really, there's sort of two processes here uh, and, and I think I've alluded to them a little bit uh, to some extent. Um, and that One of them is just this, this idea of positioning and that is that you need to um, communicate not only in a way that it m makes sense and is understandable, but also uh, the concepts that you that you communicate you need to define what it is that you're actually talking about. So sometimes, sometimes things might be pretty tangible, uh, and say you know you might want to you're actually talking about coral, but sometimes it might be a lot less tangible. It might be things like pride, or it might be things like about heritage. It might be about um, the next generation. It might be about so you need to think about what, what are the actual concepts that are most most relevant um, for the way you're communicating with with your target audience? And and it is not always you know immediately clear what is always what is the best way of of getting a particular message across. And the other one is this idea of differentiating your offer. So there there will be lots of competing messages, lots of competing influences out there, and you need to make sure that your message, the way you you frame the, the issue, is the one that. Uh, uh, resonates the most, and so, so, as sort of an example of 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 how, I guess, a contrast of how a lot of the industry um, has done this and how we do this in conservation, I'm just going to propose that we just um, watch this uh, short, very short video.
So really the point I was trying to make with that video is that, and, and this is a video that, um, it's, it's uh, one of the opening videos at the World of Coca-Cola in Atlanta. And one of the things that, I, that surprised me a lot uh, when I saw this video first was that there really is no mention of Coca-Cola as such. Um, you know, you think about some of the keywords that they use, there were keywords like laughter, fun, happiness, those types of keywords, they're really not, they're really not nothing to do with the Coca-Cola as the drink itself. I mean, they could have, they could have led this ad with, um, it's very low in sodium, could, could, could have talked about how there's, it's not a significant source of fat or saturated trans fat or, and, but it didn't. So they led this with this, this idea that, if you drink Coke, if you are associated with Coke in some way, if you buy it, if you drink it, um, this is the type of thing that you will get. That, that's your benefit exchange, right? Coca-Cola will give you these moments of happiness, this laughter, this fun. And so in this way, Coca-Cola is positioning itself in a way that not only is a lot more robust, but at the same time, it's really nothing, you know, it's not about the freshness of the drink, it's not about the, the, the flavor it might have, it's not about any of that, it's nearly not related to the, to the actual physical product that you buy at all. It's a lot more abstract. And so that sort of, I, I find it interesting because it contrasts a lot with how we talk about a lot of sort of our, the things that matter to us, biodiversity nature. So very often when we're talking about, say, species, for example, this is the sort of, um, of information that we will give out to people. This is how we will describe uh, the things that matter to us in terms of, you know, scientific names and uh, how big it gets and uh, when does it reproduce and we'll show some pictures and, but, and, and this is interesting information and it's important for those people, for those groups of people that have a particular interest in the marine environment. But as we know, that's not always the case and in many, in many contexts, it's actually quite a minority of people who have an interest in the marine environment and we should we should be okay with the fact that not everyone loves lives the ocean. Um, and so we really have to find what are the other ways that we can transmit, communicate this message, the importance of these, um, of these uh, ecological elements or, uh, or, or, bi or biodiversity elements, say. Um, how can we get that message across in a different way that makes sense, that, that resonates with audiences that might not have this initial interest, that might not have um, that put this high priority in knowing more about about the ocean. So one of them that I thought was really interesting is this campaign that was in the United States, where in essence crabs as as, as species were positioned as you know through the, the value that they have to people as a food source. People like crabs because they're tasty, and you know from the point of view of those who consume crabs, which I you know I would argue that's a, a very wide, a very wide range of group of people. Um, that that's something that resonates very strongly with them, and so it's a, it was interesting to see um, to see all this messaging being produced from the point of view of those, not not necessarily those who, you know, um, see the potential of crabs as keystone species, but more of those who like to eat crabs, uh, and so that was interesting. So a way to get a very, very, it's the same message, the importance of a particular biological biodiversity element in a different way um, and according to the values of a different, uh, of a different uh, target group. So in terms of other things that are out there um, that are also in this interface between marine and marketing, there's a couple of things I just want to leave you with. Um, so you can uh, have a look if you if you have sort of more interest after this. So one of them is this uh, project Fish Forever that I've been involved in, uh, and I think this is perhaps uh, I, I think I'm not very far off if I say it's probably the biggest scale use of social marketing in the marine conservation uh, context. And so this is a program that is a partnership uh, between Rare, the Environmental Defense Fund, and uh, University of California Santa Barbara and really works to use social marketing and behavior adoption to improve the way that small-scale coastal fisheries are managed in, um, in Belize, Brazil, Philippines, Indonesia, and Mozambique. So it works across these five countries and really focuses on elements such as governance, elements as, such as um, 
local the local policy context of fisheries, but also of course more management related issues, things like close seasons, things like uh, use of of local reserves, community based sort of reserves, um, gears, all of that, um, to really drive and improve the way that fisheries are uh, or small scale fisheries are managed. And so I I invite you to uh, um, have a look at the at the website of the project fishfair.com org, I believe. Um, I think it will be a, it's it's a pretty interesting example of how marketing and, and more traditional uh, tools like community-based conservation uh, and community-based uh, marine protected areas uh, could be used uh, together. So the other example I wanted to um, talk about is this conservation marketing working group that the Society of Conservation Biology has, um, has, has put in place in the last year. Um, we have created this working group and now have more than 160 members and uh, we, we are on, on uh, Facebook and Twitter so you can, um, you can, even if you're not a member of the society, you can still follow sort of the latest developments and we, um, we put out sort of a lot of news on latest research, uh, webinars such as this one, um, but also just, you know, any relevant uh, piece of information that might interest those who are uh, really have an interest in this interface between um, marketing and conservation. Um, it is particularly, uh, this is the website, conbio.org, um, and it's particularly interesting for um, those of you who have a, a marine uh, focus because we will have a series of events, um, the working group will have a series of events at the next International Marine Congress, uh, Marine Conservation Congress. Um, which will be in in Canada um, at end of end of July, beginning of August. And so, uh, if any of you will be uh, around for for that for that event, then um, you'll have you will will have a, a a few events that will will we hope to catalyze more of this interest of 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 conservation and marine conservationists in in social marketing and marketing tools. So uh, I guess I, I I want to make sure that I'm I'm pretty happy we have still have quite a lot of time for questions. I wanted to make sure that um, we really had and a lot of time to focus on what you have interest in, uh, rather than uh, me trying to guess what what might be the most relevant uh, thing to talk about. Given that there's so much that we could uh, focus on, and so all I'd like to do is um, have Science Cat thank you uh, for your time. And of course, uh, leave my contact uh, information in case you want to uh, follow up or uh, have any uh, interest on some, some of the things I might be involved in. So thank you very much. Great. All right. Thank you so much, Diogo. That was great. Um, just as a reminder, I want to let everyone know how to ask questions. You can type them in to the question panel, and I'll relay them to Diogo, or you could raise your virtual hand. Julie, you have your hand raised. Uh, it's been up for a while. So, um, and then I can try and unmute you when we'll see if that works for you to ask a question directly to Diogo. Um, but we'll get, we have a couple questions in right now, and um, I'm sure people sense more. Um, let's see. How successful was the crab eating campaign in terms of raising money? Uh huh. So, so uh, I should have said a little bit more about this. So the crab, the crab, the crab campaign was um, the idea of the the goal of it was to get people to manage their lawns in in a particular way so that the runoff of um, herbicides and pesticides um, to local rivers was diminished. So that was the the objective of that campaign. Um, so I, I I know that there there has been and there's a there's a book chapter um, on on this particular campaign and they have have, have had some success on changing practices on uh, on some of the local uh, local uh, house owners. So I think there has been a reasonable uh, important impact. Of course, that with some of these some of these um, with some of these campaigns, and I think a lot of the this is one of the challenges of social marketing in the uh, biodiversity conservation context is that sometimes it takes it takes time from the change in behavior to the actual change in environmental, say, you know, the concentration of environmental pollutants or uh, particular chemicals. So you might st still see people changing their practices, but then when it comes to the actual environmental variables that you're interested in, there might there might be a time lag between one change and the actual, um, you know, and changes in the environment. So it, it's always a little bit uh, difficult to assert exactly what. Uh, the level of, of, of environmental impact that it has. Okay, thank you, Diogo. Um, and there was, let's see, um, 
sort of related to that, um, do you have any concrete examples of conservation campaigns that raised a substantial amount of, of money? Yeah, so, uh, so, so, let me think. So I, I will say, I'll, I'll put a disclaimer out that my focus has really not been on fundraising. My focus has been on ch behavior change. And so I, I am, I'll try, I'm trying to find a way. I mean, so I know that, um, I know that there have been a lot of um, successful fundraising schemes from uh, different uh, conservation NGOs. So for example, um, uh, one example I would say that actually has a marketing related story is uh, the Hotspots campaign by Conservation International. Um, so that was highly successful at fundraising for conservation at, uh, at various points on earth. And, but actually Hotspots, if you think about Hotspots as a marketing, as a marketing tool, as a brand, that's a science-based brand. Um, it's actually it, it's actually a really interesting use of marketing techniques. I mean, given that, um, say for example, if you look at the map of hotspots, it includes huge tracts of land. Like for example, Madagascar, the entire island of Madagascar is um, is a is a hotspot. And so, but at the same time, it it creates this instrument that allows you to use very high profile places such as say Madagascar, Amazonia, to fundraise for other places that might be less. Um, marketable and so this umbrella uh, brand of the hotspots actually allowed Conservation International to fundraise for a lot of locations that would have been I guess trickier um, if they were trying to fundraise individual for each location okay thank you Diogo um, let's try going to some folks who have their hands raised we'll try uh, oh, oh Hillary you disappeared okay we'll try let's see if Julie's there Julie mm -hmm. Julie, did you want to ask a question? Okay, it might be an accident that the hand is raised. All right, so we have a bunch of others. Let's see. Um, okay. Uh, it, they're all veering on evaluation, uh, or a lot of okay. them. Um, okay. Let's see. Let's go. Uh, how do you evaluate behavior change effectiveness through Facebook? What key criteria or indicators can be used to show behavior change? That's a, that's a really good question. So that's actually my, my current focus is impact evaluation. And so, um, you know, I, I welcome those questions. So um, I, don't, I don't think there is, I mean, the, the, the simple and perhaps, you know, not, not, your, not that what you wanted to hear is that there really, I don't think there really is a way of evaluating behavior change through social media. I think social media has some, it can give you some indication of how much reach you have. Um, but I would definitely argue that, um, Unless you have some other uh, other way you, in which you can look at what people have done online, um, and this could be you know as easy as um, some some campaigns have have opted uh, to use things like petition signing, for example. Others have looked at donations. I've done uh, some work on online donations for conservation, so that's one type of behavior online that it's pretty easy to track. Um, but it, when it comes to social media and things like Facebook, and you you looking at things like say shares or likes um, I, I would argue that um, that really is more of an indicator of, of that people are engaging with your content but not necessarily that uh, that they will, that will then transpire and be translated into uh, an actual actual behavior change I don't know if I hope that answered the question if not please do follow up okay um, I'll let folks send in the follow-up and we'll, we'll go a different uh, Direction, but um, because there were a lot, but if anyone wants to follow up on the evaluation aspect, please do. Um, okay, let's see. How do you maintain neutrality in, in quotation marks and legitimacy within a community if you are pitching different marketing campaigns that may conflict with each other in order to reach stakeholder groups that may be in conflict? Yeah, so that's that's a, that's a very that's a very uh, that's a very good question. I so I, I'm afraid I don't have the answer to that. Um, that that's that that's that's that does happen, and I think particularly I think it, it would happen. Let me see if I can phrase this. So I think that situation is a lot more common that we recognize, and the reason that is a lot more common than we recognize is that very often when we do a lot of uh, conservation work at the, at the local level, we really don't have a very good understanding of what the different values and attitudes and uh, of the different groups within uh, a community are, and, and so I think that's actually quite common. Um, it's a quite common situation, but it's also incredibly, uh, incredibly uh, challenging. Um, I, I guess, I guess what I, 
without really re answering your question, I'm afraid because I really don't know. Uh, I think it's a, it's, it is a very challenging, uh, uh, you know, uh, aspect of, of dealing with complete, conflicting messages. I think what I would like to, uh, I would just say that it's it's very important not to alienate groups within a community um, because in the long term, it's that's likely to um, to to jeopardize and 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 undermine any success you might have in the short term. So I would rather I would rather and instead of caution and have a message that might resonate less but be less conflictive than um, than a risk a more uh, a more sort of open conflict within the community and becoming um, and becoming another 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 party I guess in that in the in the problem. Okay. All right. Thank you, Diego. Um, this is, I like this question. Um, any ideas for marketing the absence of something? We're trying to help retailers market to customers their commitment to only selling non-invasive plants. We aren't just trying to promote native plants, which makes it more difficult to explain to consumers. Uh, so, so it's the absence of invasives, not just natives. Is that Correct. is that the question? Correct. Correct. Yeah. Um. I don't know. So, so of, I mean, I, I'm not a, I'm not a, a um, I don't, I'm a specialist in invasive species. But my sort of, my sort of knee-jerk reaction is, is what is the, if there is a very, very, what is there a very, very big difference between marketing the absence of invasives and marketing the presence of natives? And this is because obviously, I think a positive, a positive message would, like the presence of natives, is something that would be a, a lot more, a lot more. Uh, a message that's a lot more easy to, uh, or easier to to communicate and to get across, and to also the fact that something is native or something is from a particular region is is something that's a lot more easy to for people to relate to, uh, and so, I mean, without without risking r risking, uh, in the fact that I, I'm actually not, uh, I don't have a lot of detailed knowledge on that particular issue. I would, I guess, what I would ask is, is there a way that you can focus on on natives rather than the absence of invasives, um, and do your messaging through through that um, through that sort of lens. Okay, all right. Thank you, Diogo. Um, then this is just a comment um, uh, from Julia Townsend. It says, as a side note, I think social media can be a powerful tool for evaluation if you're prompting individuals to take action and share that they did something through social media. For example, uh, replace part of their lawns and share a picture by a certain date to be entered into a contest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's. I think that's a very, that's a valuable comment. So I think there is a role for social media in exactly those types of situations where, for example, you can see people within your peers or your peer network or within uh, your family or the networks that. Um, that you value those those groups, social groups you're part of. If you see a lot of those people make a particular change, it can be powerful in terms of changing your social norms. Um, I guess where I'm less, and I think that's absolutely true. I think, um, and you can have a lot of uh, drive drive behavior change in that way. Um, what I'm less convinced about is if you can measure the behavior change through that, um, simply because. Um, there are things, for example, you know, um, the fact that those people who are most likely to share and to take part into into these campaigns are always, the reporting is always very very small, um, and also those people who are most enthusiastic about sharing things on Facebook and social media are people that um, are the most likely to share and the most likely to change their behavior, and in a lot of situations would have changed behavior regardless uh, of there being a campaign or not. So it becomes very difficult once you're trying to once you you're trying to pose the question, would this change have happened without the campaign, and what would the world look like uh, without the campaign? Thinking about counterfactuals, um, that becomes it becomes tricky to use uh, social media uh, data. But I'm I'm happy you know I'm happy to discuss that in more in more detail uh, if if anyone's interested. Okay, thank you. Um, Nick, could you post um, to everyone uh, the link where the recording will be? Uh, I we probably won't have a PDF of the presentation, but we will have a recording that will be available, and that will be posted in the comments section right now. Um, so there were two comments from audience members, and not questions per se, but just talking about the natives versus invasives. Hi, yeah. Um, 
Okay, I see one. I actually have some experience regarding focusing on natives instead of invasives for the last question. One possible approach is equating specific invasives with nat natives based on function, water use, drought tolerance, blooming, et cetera, to show consumers that natives can provide the same function they are looking for when considering invasives, and then build on that to then market the additional benefits of natives, uh, such as they support local pollinators and wildlife habitat. Um, and then there was another con comment as, thank you for your answer. It highlights the difficulty of our task. We can't heavily promote or focus on native plants because that would alienate many of our retail partners who are for the most part selling non-native uh -huh. species. All right. Yeah, thank you. That, that's, that's, uh, that, that, that does bring, um, yeah, I think it's interesting. It brings sort of the double-edged sword of uh, some of the partnerships and um, ways in which you can reach a, a, a wider audience, but at the same time, it li limits the way you can message out to your audience. And so that's, that's a, a very interesting challenge that I actually was not aware of. Okay. Uh, let's see, another question. Um, we have a bunch to choose from. Um, apart from evoking positive behavior changes in people that are interested, how can you use these tools to neutralize detractors, um, those that might set up roadblocks to getting positive outcomes? Um, so, so I, I think, I think one, one way, um, one way of thinking about those groups, and I think traditionally social marketing has, has used a lot more positive messaging, and so, which means that it's, it's, it's been more or less about, um, alternatives and, what you could do and focusing on the, that positive sort of um, side of the message rather than focusing on the groups that need to stop doing something. And that is because um, there's a lot of um, sort of very often and, and sometimes social marketing has been criticized for being sort of paternalistic and sort of telling people what they can't do and sort of uh, who, who can tell what other people can and cannot do. And, um, and so um, what I would say, I think a lot of, um, a lot of, um, efforts have been put around the concept of social norms. So this idea that um, if the group, the social groups, might be your peers, might be uh, some other context, if you see um, a change happening around you and what's considered acceptable around you uh, is changing, then you can uh, you can get to um, you can you can drive behavior change of those individuals, even if through the behavior change of others rather than targeting them directly. And so this is something that, um, for example, if we think about some of the challenges that have been, that we've, we have now with um, wildlife trade, for example, or, or, or wildlife trafficking, say, with products like rhino horn, um, where you have a very small minority of consumers or, or a relatively small portion of the population consuming these products, uh, and very often that the, a lot of the efforts that have been uh, targeted at these these groups have been through uh, the social norms in creating a new social norm and getting these individuals to change their behavior not because they were targeted directly but because um, they they sense that what is acceptable which what what is seen as positive and favorable it is now changed okay all right thank you Diogo um, this question, how can we save animal species that don't have direct or obvious utilitarian values? Uh, do mm -hmm. you have any examples? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's, that's a very good question. So, yes, so um, so I, I, I think, uh, and for those of you who might not be familiar with the work of, of Rare, um, is an NGO who has really uh, led a lot of the uh, use of social marketing and conservation. They, they uh, are a very good example of how you could message around a species that don't have an utilitarian value. So they, they call their, they, they've, they call their campaign pride campaigns and historically they've really f worked with a lot of, um, you know, smaller birds uh, or, um, you know, even in a lot of uh, places, even uh, in some places, even uh, invertebrates, for example, and in a couple of places, uh, mammals as well. But so species that don't necessarily have, um, uh, you know, they're not hunted, they're not used for eating or anything like that, but they frame the messaging around the pride of place, for example. Um, for example, a lot of times they'll pick species that have a particular link to a, a, an island or a location or a particular, you know, regional focus, and they focus and they, they, they associate that species with the identity the, of, of that location. And so through that, um, you can really build very positive linkages and messaging around species that have 
you know, really no uh, direct use uh, uh, value. Okay, thank you, Diogo. Um, let's see. Um, can you speak to specific behavior change models that you use in your work? Behavior change models. So, um, so I, 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 I think I'm, I'm, I was a little bit skeptical of, of, uh, of models in the sense, and, and they're useful, they're useful because, um, because they help us sort of think through some of the more, some of the complexities um, that, we, that we face. So I can give you an example of, of how, um, and this again is going to be a rare based example because I think it's one of the, the ones that has been more, um, they have been more, um, Sort of apply to conservation. So I think obviously you have the more sort of classic theory of plant behavior type um, uh, models and their uh, adaptations. And at rare, they have this sort of theory of change um, that's based on sort of thinking of thinking through knowledge attitudes and interpersonal communication, and then how that relates to um, uh, barrier removal and then leads to behavior change. And I don't know if that answers exactly the, the, the question you're answering. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to, to share sort of more, more technical um, sort of details on this. But in essence, that, that's been sort of the, the, the basis of, uh, and I think it's a lot of the adapted from the, the theory of planned behavior and, and, and a lot of those other models that came from there. Um, but I think one of the things that I'm always a little bit reluctant about in this type of models is that um, very often when you uh, start looking at um, diverse, um, diverse topics, even in something like conservation, their ability to predict what actually goes on is uh, often quite limited. And so, um, you know, I think they have their place and they're important for us to um, get our heads around some of these complexities, but I, 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 don't, I don't sort of emphasize them very much in my work. Okay, thank you, Tiago. Um, and for everyone, uh, Jeff Keith sent in an example of absence-driven marketing, uh, a link to, to something, so I just posted that in the comments section, if anyone wanted to check it out. Um, let's see. Uh, here's a big picture question. Uh, do you have any suggestions for how NOAA can do a better job marketing conservation and stewardship, uh, especially to fishers? Uh, so, so that I, so the, 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 the honest answer is that I don't know enough about the work that NOAA does with fishers to, to have an answer to that, and I certainly don't want to guess too much. Um, so that's so that's something that uh, I, I think the most honest, the most honest answer I can give is that I'll be happy to discuss that um, uh, as a follow up uh, with a little bit more sort of background, but uh, without knowing more about what what the projects are, what the what the challenges you are tackling are, it, it's actually very uh, it's it's very difficult for me to have an answer. That's fair, Diego. Uh, uh, and the questioner says, uh, sorry. Uh, not totally fair. Um, let's see. Uh, what is a, let's see. What is a valuable communication tool, skill, or skill that scientists or resource managers could benefit from learning? Hmm. Huh. Um. That is a very good question. Um, I, I, so depending on, on, on how we are, I mean a skill, in, in a sort of an abstract format, I guess, um, I think a very, uh, very useful, um, a very important sort of uh, um, skill is this, the ability to really get to know the, the values and attitudes and and attitudes of of the groups that you're working with. So very often, um, there I think there are, I think there there's a, a this assumption that um, because you spend a lot of time with a particular group of people, or because um, you've spent a lot of time working on a particular issue, that you have you know perfect information uh, about what a particular group of people think or, or or do. And I think we also sometimes forget that our own positions, particularly if we are within uh, a conservation issue, all the information that we receive is already filtered through because people we interact with have know where we stand in a particular issue and know that we're not just a neutral uh, you know, agent. And so I think 
I don't know if that is the type of skill that uh, the question referred to or if it was something more specific, um, but I would definitely, um, I, one of the key things I've, I've come across is this, um, the need for a, a better, just a better understanding of um, what, where the differences are and what the, what the, where different stakeholders stand on, on, on an issue. Okay, thank you, Diogo. Um, let's see. What what is the best way to get to know your audience? Demographics, surveying, something else? That's a very good, okay. okay. Um, so it, it really depends. So I, I'm interpreting the, that, that question in sort of two ways. One, in terms of what is the most important information to know? And the second is what is the way that you can obtain that information? So in terms of I think information, what information you want to you you want to know. What I would what I would um, what I would highlight is that very often the easiest information to obtain is not the most important information. So very often when we're thinking about oh no oh you know what groups are there in our in our target audience, it's very easy to uh, think about things like age, gender. Um, when we're dividing a particular group and we are looking for a particular uh, uh, differences or subgroups, but very often those characteristics are really not that important and a lot more important are things like people's values and attitudes towards a particular issue, so a lot more of the, the psychographics, so how people feel and how people perceive a particular issue rather than the more generic sort of demographic information that while being a lot easier to obtain, um, you know, through census and through other, other, other uh, sources of data, um, it it, ne it doesn't sometimes it's not as rich um, it's not as rich as uh, as 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 it can be uh, to to address a particular issue in terms of the actual way of collecting information. What I would say is that it really varies with the audience. So um, obviously, internet and where we have an internet connected audience, that's a big advantage potentially. Um, However, um, in a lot of places, one one way that I'm I'm now finding finding in if, in even in developing countries where you can really get a lot of um, traction potentially is SMS as well. Um, you can get uh, are these SMS uh, survey services that are now um, that 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 can really get you a lot of um, a lot of information in a relatively small uh, time period and even in audiences where um, they might be logistically difficult to access, for example. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Diogo. Um, and we'll end there. Although we have, there's a couple more questions, and I'll send you um, I'll send you a, a document afterwards, which will have all the questions, um, including the ones we weren't able to get to. So sure. I'd like to thank, thank everyone for. Okay. Well, I'd like to thank everyone who was able to be here today, um, and Nick Weiner, who was helping to co-host. Oh, uh, Nick. Thank you. Org. And I'd like to thank Diogo for a great presentation and a lot of question answering. Um, so. Uh, Diogo, if you wanted to say anything to the audience, and well, well, I just want to again thank you for um, thank you for for your time and for uh, sharing this uh, this hour with me and uh, for your interest in uh, in this topic. And uh, and I just want to say for any of you who had questions or uh, have interest, please do uh, feel free to drop me a line and to engage. And I'm I'm happy to um, discuss any of these issues uh, further. So yes, thank you, thank you for 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 listening, and uh, thank you for the invitation, of course. Okay, and and yeah, thank you everyone for attending. Have a great afternoon, great evening, great morning. Although, so <laughs> you there. Uh, okay, and we'll, hopefully we'll see you on a, 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 a subsequent webinar. Okay, bye everyone. Bye bye.